Good evening. I hope you've had a wonderful day today. Welcome to BVJ's Bedtime Stories. My name is Big Voice J, and this is a show where we get you ready for a great night's sleep with some old familiar stories that you haven't heard in a while. Links to every story can be found in the show notes at our website, bedtimewithbvj.com. Tonight we continue our story, The Adventure of the Noble Bachelor, by Arthur Conan Doyle. It was after five o'clock when Sherlock Holmes left me, but I had no time to be lonely, for within an hour there arrived a confectioner's man with a very large flat box. This he unpacked with the help of a youth whom he had brought with him, and presently, to my very great astonishment, a quite epicurean little cold supper began to be laid out upon our humble lodging house mahogany. There were a couple of brace of cold woodcock, a pheasant, a pat foie pry with a group of ancient and cobwebby bottles. Having laid out all these luxuries, my two visitors vanished away, like the genie of the Arabian Nights, with no explanation save that the things had been paid for and were ordered to this address. Just before nine o'clock, Sherlock Holmes stepped briskly into the room. His features were gravely set, but there was a light in his eye which made me think that he had not been disappointed in his conclusions. They have laid the supper then, he said, rubbing his hands. You seem to expect company. They have laid for five. Yes, I fancy we may have some company, Drub, said. I am surprised that Lord St. Simon has not already arrived. Ha! I fancy that I hear his step now upon the stairs. It was indeed our visitor afternoon who came bustling in, dangling his glasses more vigorously than ever, and with a very perturbed expression upon his aristocratic features. "'My messenger reached you, then?' asked Holmes. "'Yes, and I confess that the contents startled me beyond measure. "'Have you good authority for what you say?' "'The best possible.' Lord St. Simon sank into a chair and passed his hand over his forehead. "'What will the Duke say?' he murmured. "'When he hears that one of the family has been subjected to such humiliation. "'It is the purest accident. "'I cannot allow that there is any humiliation.' Ah, you look on these things from another standpoint. I fail to see that anyone is to blame. I can hardly see how the lady could have acted otherwise, though her abrupt method of doing it was undoubtedly to be regretted. Having no mother, she had no one to advise her of such a crisis. It was a slight, sir, a public slight, said Lord St. Simon, tapping his fingers upon the table. You must make allowance for this poor girl, placed in so unprecedented a I will make no allowance. I am very angry indeed, and I have been shamefully used. I think that I heard a ring, said Holmes. Yes, there are steps on the landing. If I cannot persuade you to take a lenient view of the matter, Lord St. Simon, I have brought an advocate here who may be more successful. He opened the door and ushered in a lady and gentleman. Lord St. Simon, said he, allow me to introduce you to Mr. and Mrs. Francis Hay Moult. The lady, I think, you have already met. At the sight of these newcomers, our client had sprung from his seat and stood very erect with his eyes cast down and his hand thrust in the breast of his frock coat, a picture of offended dignity. The lady had taken a quick step forward and had held out her hand to him, but he still refused to raise his eyes. It was as well for his resolution, perhaps, for her pleading face was one which it was hard to resist. "'You're angry, Robert,' said she. "'Well, I guess you have every cause to be.' "'Pray make no apology to me,' said Lord St. Simon bitterly. "'Oh, yes, I know that I have treated you real bad, "'and that I should have spoken to you before I went, "'but I was kind of rattled, "'and from the time when I saw Frank here again, "'I just didn't know what I was doing or saying. "'I only wonder I didn't fall down "'and do a faint right there before the altar. "'Perhaps, Mrs. Moulton,' You would like my friend and me to leave the room while you explain this matter. If I may give an opinion, remarked the strange gentleman, we've had just a little too much secrecy over this business already. For my part, I should like all Europe and America to hear the rights of it. He was a small, wiry, sunburnt man, clean-shaven with a sharp face and alert manner. Then I'll tell our story right away, said the Frank here and I met in 84 in McGuire's camp near the Rockies, where Pa was working a claim. We were engaged to each other, Frank and I, but then one day Father struck a rich pocket and made a pile, 
while poor Frank here had a claim that petered out and came to nothing. The richer Pa grew, the poorer was Frank, so at last Pa wouldn't hear of our engagement lasting any longer, and he took me away to Frisco. Frank wouldn't throw up his hand, though, so he followed me here, and he saw me without Pa knowing anything about it. It would have only made him mad to know, so we just fixed it all up for ourselves. Frank said that he would go and make his pile, too, and never come back to claim me until he had as much as Pa. So then I promised to wait for him till the end of time and pledged myself not to marry anyone else while he lived. Why shouldn't we be married right away then, said he, and then I will feel sure of you, and I won't claim to be your husband until I come back. Well, we talked it over, and he had fixed it all up so nicely with the clergyman all ready and waiting, and we just did it right there. And Frank sent off to seek his fortune, and I went back to Paul. The next I heard of Frank was that he was in Montana, and then he went prospecting in Arizona, and then I heard of him from New Mexico. After that came a long newspaper story about how a miner's camp had been attacked by Apache Indians, and there was my Frank's name among the killed. I fainted dead away, and I was very sick for months after. Paul thought I had a decline and took me to half the doctors in Frisco. Not a word of news came for a year or more, so that I never doubted that Frank was really dead. Then Lord St. Simon came to Frisco, and we came to London, and a marriage was arranged, and Pa was very pleased. But I felt all the time that no man on this earth would ever take the place in my heart that had been given to my poor Frank. Still, if I had married Lord St. Simon, of course I'd have done my duty by him. We can't command our love, but we can our actions. I went to the altar with him with the intention to make him just as good a wife as it was in me to be. But you may imagine what I felt when, just as I came to the altar rails, I glanced back and saw Frank standing and looking at me out of the first pew. I thought it was his ghost at first, but when I looked again, there he was still, with a kind of question in his eyes, as if to ask me whether I were glad or sorry to see him. I wonder I didn't drop. I knew that everything was turning round, and the words of the clergyman were just like the buzz of a bee in my ear. I didn't know what to do. Should I stop the service and make a scene in the church? I glanced at him again, and he seemed to know what I was thinking, for he raised his finger to his lips to tell me to be still. Then I saw him scribble on a piece of paper, and I knew that he was writing me a note. As I passed his pew on the way out, I dropped my bouquet over to him, and then he slipped the note into my hand when he returned me the flowers. It was only a line asking me to join him when he made the sign to me to do so. Of course, I never doubted for a moment that my first duty was now to him. I determined to do just whatever he might direct. When I got back, I told my maid, who had known him in California, and who had always been his friend. I ordered her to say nothing but to get a few things packed and my ulster ready. I knew I ought to have spoken to Lord St. Simon, but it was dreadful hard before his mother and all those great people. I just made up my mind to run away and explain afterwards. I hadn't been at the table ten minutes before I saw Frank out of the window at the other side of the road. He beckoned to me and then began walking into the park. I slipped out, put on my things, and followed him. Some woman came talking something or other about Lord St. Simon to me, saying to me from the little I heard as if he had a little secret of his own before marriage also. But I managed to get away from her and soon overtook Frank. We got into a cab together, and away we drove to some lodgings he had taken in Gordon Square. And that was my true wedding after all these years of waiting. Frank had been a prisoner among the Apaches, had escaped, come on to Frisco, found that I had given him up for dead and had gone to England, followed me there, and had come upon me at last on the very morning of my second wedding. I saw it in the paper, exclaimed the American. It gave the name in the church, but not where the lady lived. Then we had a talk as to what we should do, and Frank was all for openness, but I was so ashamed of it all that I felt as if I should like to vanish away and never see any of them again, just sending a line to Pa, perhaps, to show him that I was alive. It was awful to me to think of all those lords and ladies sitting around that breakfast table and waiting for me to come back. So Frank took my wedding clothes and things and made a bundle of them so that I should not be traced and drop them away somewhere where no one could find them. It is likely that we should have gone on to Paris tomorrow, only that this good gentleman, Mr. Holmes, came round to us this evening. Though how he found us is more than I can think. And he showed us very clearly and kindly that I was wrong and that Frank was right and that we should be putting ourselves in the wrong if we were so secret. 
Then he offered to give us a chance of talking to Lord St. Simon alone, and so we came right away round to his rooms at once. Now, Robert, you have heard it all, and I am very sorry if I have given you pain, and I hope that you do not think very meanly of me. Lord St. Simon had by no means relaxed his rigid attitude, but had listened with a frowning brow and a compressed lip to this long narrative. Excuse me, he said, but it is not my custom to discuss my most intimate personal affairs in this public manner. Then you won't forgive me? You won't shake hands before I go? Oh, certainly, if it would give you any pleasure. He put out his hands and coldly grasped that what she extended to him. I had hoped, suggested Holmes, that you would have joined us in a friendly supper. I think that there you ask a little too much, responded his lordship. I may be forced to acquiesce in these recent developments, but I can hardly be expected to make merry over them. I think that, with your permission, I will now wish you all a very good night. He included us all in a sweeping bow and stalked out of the room. Then I trust that you will at least honor me with your company, said Sherlock Holmes. It is always a joy to meet an American, Mr. Moulton, for I am one of those who believe that the folly of a monarch and the blundering of a minister in far gone years will not prevent our children from being some day citizens of the same worldwide country under a flag which shall be a quartering of the Union Jack with the stars and stripes. This case had been an interesting one, remarked Holmes, when our visitors had left us, because it serves to show very clearly how simple the explanation may be of an affair which at first sight seems to be almost inexplicable. Nothing could be more natural than the sequence of events as narrated by this lady, and nothing stranger than the result when viewed, for instance, by Mr. Lestrade of Scotland Yard. You are not yourself at fault at all, then, from the first. Two facts were very obvious to me, the one that the lady had been quite willing to undergo the wedding ceremony, the other that she had repented of it within a few minutes of returning home. Obviously something had occurred during the morning then to cause her to change her mind. What could that something be? She could not have spoken to anyone when she was out, for she had been in the company of the bridegroom. Had she seen someone then? If she had, it must be someone from America, because she had spent so short a time in this country that... She could hardly have allowed anyone to acquire so deep an influence over her that the mere sight of him would induce her to change her plan so completely. You see, we have already arrived by a process of exclusion and the idea that she might have seen an American. Then who could this American be, and why should he possess so much influence over her? It might be a lover, it might be a husband. Her young womanhood had, I knew, been spent in rough scenes and under strange conditions. So far I had got before I had ever heard Lord St. Simon's narrative. When he told us of a man in a pew, of the change in the bride's behavior, of so transparent a device for obtaining a note as the dropping of a bouquet, of her resort to her confidential maid, and of her very significant allusion to claim jumping, which in minor's parlance means taking possession of that which another person has a prior claim to, the whole situation became absolutely clear. She had gone off with a man and the man was either a lover or a previous husband, the chances being in favor of the latter. And how in the world did you find them? It might have been difficult, but friend Lestrade held information in his hands, the value of which he did not himself know. The initials, of course, were of the highest importance, but more valuable still was it to know that within a week he had settled his bill at one of the most select London hotels. You deduce the select by the select prices, Eight shillings for a bed and eight pence for a glass of sherry pointed to one of the most expensive hotels. There are not many in London which charge at that rate. In the second one which I visited Northumberland Avenue, I learned by an inspection of the book that Francis H. Moulton, an American gentleman, had left on the day before, and on looking over the entries against him, I came upon the very items which I had seen in the duplicate bill. His letters were to be forwarded to 226 Gordon Square, so thither I travelled and being fortunate enough to find the loving couple at home, I ventured to give them some paternal advice and to point out to them that it would be better in every way that they should make their position a little clearer to both the general public and to Lord St. Simon in particular. I invited them to meet you here, and, as you see, I made him keep the appointment. But with no very good result, I remarked. His conduct was certainly not very gracious. Ah, Watson, said Holmes, smiling. 
Perhaps you would not be very gracious either if, after all the trouble of wooing and wedding, you found yourself deprived in an instant of wife and of fortune. I think that we may judge Lord St. Simon very mercifully and thank our stars that we are never likely to find ourselves in the same position. Draw your chair up and hand me my violin, for the only problem we have still to solve is how to while away these bleak autumnal evenings. I s Love will always find a way. Isn't that lovely? What a beautiful story. I want to remind you that we're always looking for great stories to read. You can email them, bigvoicej at gmail.com. I want to remind you to leave us a review on iTunes to help spread the word. Thank you so much for listening. Good night. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>